Part 25. His Way is on the Sea. 1. There was a family council at Silverbush when school opened in September. It was decreed that Pat must join the entrance class and prepare herself for the Queen's Academy examinations the next year. Pat protested, but Father was inexorable. He had let Winnie off, realizing that Winnie's golden curls thatched a brain that could never be brought to distinguish between a particle and an infinitive. But Pat's record in school, although never brilliant, had been above the average. So to Queen's she must go and study for a teacher's license. "'You'll get the North Glen School and board at home,' said Dad, which was the only gleam of hope Pat saw in the whole dismal prospect. She flew to the kitchen and poured out her discontent and rebellion to Judy. "'Oh, oh, and you don't want to be educated, Patsy darlin'. To be educated was all right, but to go away from home was all wrong. "'I don't seem to be like other girls, Judy. They all want to go to college and have a career. I don't. I just want to stay at Silver Bush and help you and Mother. There's work for me here, Judy. You know there is. Mother isn't strong.' As for being educated, I shall be well educated. Love educates, Judy. Oh, oh, and you're not so far out there, girlin. But there's many a thing to be considered besides. Money doesn't grow on bushes, darlin. What fun if it did! For a moment, Pat was sidetracked by a vision of little golden dollars dangling from the ends of branches like golden blossoms. Your dad isn't rich, and a family like this is expensive when they're growing up and had need in the pretty clothes. You'll have to get ready to help him out a bit with until some of ye are married or gone away. I don't want any of us to get married or go away. <sighs> You're clean unreasonable, darling. Pat was beginning to suspect that she was unreasonable that these things would have to be faced some time. For instance, Winnie had a bow. Not bows. She had had bows for over a year, and Pat had grown used to their coming and going. And Winnie's resultant chatter from dates. But a bow. Frank Russell of the Bayshore Russells seemed to have scattered all the others, and Winnie was beginning to blush painfully when Judy teased her about him. Pat hated Frank so bitterly that she could hardly be civil to him. Judy got quite out of patience with her. Ye ought to have a little bit of sense, Pat. Young Frank be way of having a real good match. The Russells do be knowing how to make one hand wash the other. An only son and his mother dead and all the Bayshore girls trying to nab him. Winnie just be stepping into the grand old Russell place at the Bay Shore and be quiet, with never a mother in law to look black at her if she moved to Sophie, and that near home and all. Winnie's too young to think of being married, protested Pat. Sure, and the darling is eighteen. There's no question of being married yet a while. She must have her court in time as is proper. But a rustle always means business, and young Frank has the glint in his eye. I'm telling ye, he knows where to be coming for a good wife. He isn't very intelligent, snapped Pat. Will ye listen at her? He ain't much for writing poetry or building fancy houses like your jingle. I'm supposing, but he's got a real grip on politics as long Alec was quick to see, and I'm klein missin' me guess if he don't be in Parliament be the time he's a bit bald. You're not needin' any great intelligence for that. Winnie's no real scholar herself, the darlin', but there isn't the like of her for the light biscuit on the island. She'll be the grand housekeeper for the fine house. I'm telling ye. Pat didn't want telling. The thought of Winnie ever leaving home, no matter how long the courting days were, remained intolerable. She continued to hate Frank, but she resigned herself to the entrance class and even took up the work with a certain grim determination to do well for the sake of Silver Bush. She knew people thought that Silver Bush family was lacking in ambition. Joe had stubbornly refused to go to school after he was fifteen. 
Winnie had always been dumb when it came to lessons. Sid was determined to know farming and nothing else, so it was up to her to re-establish the gardener credit in the halls of learning. I'm so thankful Betts is in the entrance class too, Judy. I was afraid for a long while she couldn't be. Her father thought she wasn't strong enough, but Betts coaxed so hard he had given in. If Betts is in with me when I go to Queen's, it won't be so bad, supposing I ever get there. Supposing, is it? Sure, and there isn't much doubt, but ye get there, clever and all as ye are, when ye give your mind to it. When I watch ye working out them queer algebra things, it makes me have wheels in me head. As for your geometry, stuff, oh, gentleman Tom himself couldn't be seen through it. Geometry is my favorite class, Judy. Betts doesn't like it, but she loves everything else I love. We have planned to study together each night about it all through the winter. We'll study hard for two hours, and then we'll talk. I believe ye. The little tongues of ye do be always clacking. Yes, but Judy, there are times when we don't talk at all. We just sit and think. Sometimes we don't even think. We just sit. It's enough just to be together. And oh, Judy, Bets and I, I did be here and ye as calling each other Elizabeth and Patricia. <laughs> Pat laughed. We did try to, but it didn't work. Elizabeth and Patricia sound like strangers. We didn't know ourselves. As I was saying, Bets and I have to begin reading the Bible right through. We've not, we're not going to skip a single chapter, not even those awful names in Chronicles. We have no idea how interesting the Bible you have no idea how interesting the Bible is, Judy, when you read it just as a story. Oh, oh, haven't I now? Sure, and I wasn't I reading me Bible afore ye were born or thought of. But I did be skipping the names. There were too many jaw breakers among them for me. I do be wondering if there never was any nicknames in them days. Do you think now, Patsy dear, that every time Jehoshaphat's mother called him to his little dinner, she said the whole name? 2. The autumn drifted by. Maple fires were kindled around the secret field. Bracken and Lady Fern turned brown in happiness. Jordan ran to the sea between borders of purple ashers. Golden harvest moons looked down over the hill of the mist. A gracious September and a mellow October were succeeded by a soft and sad November. Then long, silken lines of rain slanted along the sh sheer hillsides. And then one day, without any warning, came the first break in the family at Silverbush. They had all, except Joe, been spending Saturday afternoon and evening at the Bayshore farm where nothing had changed in Pat's remembrance. It was a world where all things always seemed the same. She was beginning to love the Bay Shore for that very changelessness. It seemed the one place you could depend on in a changing world. Aunt Frances and Aunt Honor were just as stately as ever, though they had given up asking her to say Bible verses and tapping her on the head when they disapproved of her. They still disapproved of her in many things, but Pat liked even the disapproval, because anything else would have been change. Cousin Danny still wore his elfish grin. The great-great was still alive, at ninety-eight, and not a day older, apparently, nor any other complimentary. Every time she saw Pat, she said, huh, Nay, beauty, in the same peevish tone, as if Pat were entirely to blame for it. The vase that had made the face at Sarah Jenkins still stood on the same bracket, and the polished door knob still brightly reflected your face. The white ivory elephants had never finished marching across the mantel, and the red and yellow china hen had evidently never succeeded in hatching out her eggs. Betts was with them, and this added to the pleasure of the day. It was such fun to show Betts everything. The ants liked her. But who could help liking Betts? Even the great-great peered at her with admiration in her bright old eyes, and for once forgot to tell Pat that she was no beauty. When they came back to Silverbush, Pat must walk up the hill with Bats. It had turned colder, 
and the first snowfall was whitening down over the twilight world when Pat came into the kitchen. At once she saw that something must be wrong, terribly wrong. Mother was looking as white as if she had been struck. Winnie was crying. And Judy, of all people, had been crying. Sid looked as if he were trying not to cry. Father stood by the table holding a letter in his hand. Snicklefrit sat by him, looking up with mute, imploring eyes. Gentleman Tom had an air of not liking things. Even bold and bad, whom ordinarily nothing could subdue, crouched with an apologetic air under the stove. Pat looked around. Everybody was there, except, except. "'Where's Joe?' she cried. For a moment nobody spoke. Then Winnie sobbed. He's gone. Gone? Where? To sea. He went to the harbor tonight and sailed in Pierce Morgan's vessel for the West Indies. And me never suspecting it. The goneral I am, wailed Judy. Not even when he come in, all queer-like, and said he would be taking a run to Silver Bridge. Sure, and if I had known what was in his head, I would have hung on him till after the tide set. That wouldn't have done any good, said Long Alec, rousing himself from his abstraction. He was bound to go sooner or later. I've known that for some time. But he has, he's, so, oh, he's so young, and to go off like this without a word out of one of us, it was cruel of him. Oh, there, there, Mary. For mother had turned and buried her face on, the, on his shoulder with a little broken cry. Father led her out of the kitchen. Winnie and Cuddles followed. Sid went out, and Pat was weeping wildly in Judy's arms. Judy! I can't bear it! I can't bear it! Joe has to go, and like that! Sure, and it do be cruel, as long Alex said. The young fry do be cruel betimes. They don't know, they don't know! Now don't be breaking your little heart, darling. Remember, it's harder for your mother than for any of the rest of ye. Joe be back some time. But never to stay, Judy. Never to stay. Oh, I'll always hate this day, always. <sighs> oh, oh, don't be cynical now, said Judy, who picked up words as the children studied their lessons, but not always the exact meaning. Or is the sense of hate in the poor boy? You're just be looking at this in the face. It's wild Dick and your Uncle Horace all over again. Sure, and Joe had always been more like Horace than his own dad. He knew if he tried to say goodbye long, Alec would be trying to put him off. Now, keep up your pecker, Patsy, for the sake of your mother. City's here to carry on, and it's the smart lad he is. His heart's in the farm as Joe never was, and he can have driven the automobile which the old man above never intended anybody to do. Joe's gone, but he hasn't taken Silverbush with him. Did ye be after seeing the little note he left on Long Alec's desk? No. There was a message for ye in it. Tell Pat to be good to Snickle Fritz. And there was one for me, too. Be way of a joke. Oh, Joe always had a joke, the darling. Tell Judy to see that them blamed kittens in her pitcher are grown up be the time I come back. Oh, sure. And wasn't he always laughing at them same kittens? But Pat could not laugh again for a long time. She was the last one at Silverbush to resign herself to the inevitable. Eventually she found herself doing it, with a sense of shame that it could be so. But the raw, rainy winter was half over before she ceased to have sleepless nights when it stormed and began looking forward with pleasure to Joe's letters, with bewitching foreign stamps on them which Cuddles proudly collected. They were full of the glamour of strange ports and distant lands, of the lure of adventure, and white-winged distant, sorry, white-winged ships to which Pat thrilled in spite of herself. Somehow, although she hadn't believed it possible, Silverbush got on without him. 
Sid had stepped manfully into his place. In truth, Sid was glad of an excuse to leave school. Mother began to smile again. Frank Russell consoled Winnie. Everybody ceased to listen for the gay whistle that had echoed so often through the twilights around the old barns. Even Snicklefritz stopped wearing a sorrowful cast of countenance and listening mournfully to every footstep on the stone walk. Change! And worse than change, forgetfulness! It seemed dreadful to Pat that things could be forgotten. Why, they were just as bad as the family at Silver Bridge that had gone on after one son in California and one in Australia, one in India and one in Petrograd, and all didn't seem to mind it at all. Oh, oh, how could we be living if we didn't forget, me jewel, said Judy. But Christmas was so terrible, sighed Pat. The first time we weren't all here. I couldn't help thinking of something I heard you say once, that once one of a family was away for Christmas, it was likely they would never be all together again. I just couldn't eat. I didn't see how anyone else could. But do you remember how you slipped into the kitchen at bedtime, and we had a fest on the bones, said Judy slyly. 3. Everything Passes Winter was spring before they knew it. Everybody was looking forward to, with delight to Joe's ho homecoming. <clears throat> March brought a saddening letter from him. He was not coming home in Pierce Morgan's vessel. He had shipped for a voyage to China. Well, that was a disappointment. But meanwhile, March was April, with saps astir and frogs tuning up the field of the pool, and all the apple boughs that had fallen in winter storms to be gathered up and burned. Sid and Pat did that, and they and Betts and Hilary had a glorious bonfire at night. And after it was over, Pat couldn't walk home with Betts because Sid did. Pat didn't mind. She was too happy because Sid seemed to be having quite a crush on Betts this spring. He'll all out with he's all out with May Binney, Judy. Won't it be lovely if he marries Bet some day? Oh, oh, go easy with your matchmaking, said Judy sarcastically. Besides, it was nice to sit with Hilary on weeping Willie's tombstone, in the glow from the smouldering embers in the orchard, and talk about things. Pat had learned to call him Hilary. She was even beginning to think of him as Hilary, though in moments of excitement the old name popped out. Judy never could bring her tongue to call him anything else. To her, he would always be Jingle. All oh, the darlings, she would say to Gentleman Tom, looking out to her kitchen window at them. I do be wondering what's afore them in life, and how much longer it is they have to be young and light-hearted. Gentleman Tom would not tell her. April was May, with a white fire of wild cherry and happiness, and young daffodil, daffodils dancing all over the garden, and little green cones shooting up in the iris beds. Every day Pat made some new discovery. One forgets all through the year how lovely spring really is, and so it comes as a surprise every time, she said. And finally May was June with a fairy wild plum hanging out in the whispering lane, and purple waves of lilac breaking along the yard fence, and Judy's beds of white pansies all ablow, big white velvety pansies, and everywhere all different shades of green in the young spring woods on the hills. Spring is nicer at Silver Bush than anywhere else, Judy. Just look what a lovely iris! frosty white with a ripple of blue fringe every petal. It's Joe's iris. He planted it last spring. And now where is he? On the other side of the world, belike. Tell me, Patsy dear, do you be understanding how it is they don't fall off down there? I've never been able to get the hang of it into me mind somehow. Patsy tried to explain, but Judy still shook her gray bob in a maze of uncertainty. Oh, oh, it's me own stupidity I'm knowing. No, it's my fault, Judy. I've a headache tonight. Sure, and it's studying too hard ye are. 
That algebra now. It's meself to be thinking it isn't fit for girls to be learning. Morning, noon, and night as it is ye are. I must study, Judy. The entrance comes in another month, and I must pass. Father and mother will feel dreadfully if I don't. I am not afraid of the mathematics. I've always been fond of arithmetic especially. Only, do you remember how dreadfully sorry I used to be for poor A, B, and C? Because they had to work so hard. D appeared to have things easier. Sure. And I do remember how pitiful he used to look up and say, Doesn't I ever have a holiday, Judy? It's the grand marks you be making in everything I'm expecting. No, I'm much a dub in history, Judy. I can't remember dates. Dates, is it? And who cares about dates? What difference does it make when things happened as long as they did happen? The examiner thinks it makes some difference, Judy. The only two dates I'm positively sure of are that Julius Caesar landed in Britain 55 BC and that the Battle of Waterloo was fought in 1815. Outside of those things is a fog. Me own grandfather fell at the Battle of Waterloo, said Judy, and left me great-grandmother a widdy with nine small children. But that's a widdy more or less in the world now after the Great War. Do you be remembering anything of it, Pat? I was five when the armist, armis, excuse me, armistice, I can't say this word. It was five when the armistice was assigned. I remember the fireworks at the bridge and dimly people talking of it before that. It seems like a dream. You never talk of it, Judy. Sure, and I was ashamed, although it be although it because I had none of me own to go, and thankful that Sidney and Joe were children. Your mother and your Aunt Hazel and myself just knit socks for the soldiers and sat tight. It's a time I don't like to be thinking of, with everyone ranting at the Kaiser and your Uncle Tom and your dad moaning because they had they was too old to go. And us lying awake at night, worrying for fear that they'd find a loophole in spite of the family Bible. And yet all of us a bit ashamed in our hearts that we didn't have any maple leaves in the witties. Not that what there was a bit of fun about it, with all the girls that proud to be walking with the boys in cocky, and your Uncle Tom singing a hymn of hate at the backyard at Swayfield every morning afore breakfast. Sure, and if I didn't hear him shouting, I'd rather die in the trenches than live under German rule. While I was milking, I'd be running over to see if he'd gone lumbago. He was that excited with the election for the Union government was on. Sure, and I did be fearing he'd burst the blood vessel. When he found your Aunt Edith praying that it might go in, he was royal indignant. Elections ain't won by prayers, says he. And he marched her down to vote, and her protesting all the way it was unwomanly. Ye never saw such a Tommy Shaw. Sandy Taylor at the Bay Shore called his first boy John Jellico Douglas Haig Lloyd George Bonabar Lard Kitchener. Ye should have seen the look of the minister when he was christened. And after it, all the boys were as just called him slats all his life, him being so thin. They did be saying that Ralph Morgan married Jane Fisher just to escape in Liston. Sure, and I'm no judge of things matrimonial, Patsy, and never pretended to be, but it did seem to be I'd rather be facing the Kaiser and all his angels than marry a Fisher. Maybe Ralph come around to the angel, excuse me, Maybe a Ralph come around to the same way of thinking when we had the memorial service for the boys as had been killed, he heaves a big sigh and says to me, "Ah, Judy, they are at peace, says he, oh, oh, it's all over now, and I'm hoping the world will have more sense than ever to get in a mess like that same again, more betoken than the woman can be votin'. 
Old Billy Smith says, Smithson at Silverbridge doesn't agree with you, Judy. He says women are fools, and things will soon be in a worse mess than ever. Ho, ho. And are ye thinking that possible now? said Judy sarcastically. Old Billy shouldn't be after jiggling all, judging all women be his own. Well, do I remember the first time I was ever voting. I wore me blue silk and me high-heeled boots when I went to the polls, and I was the, that excited I could never tell where to put the cross on the ballot. From what I could explain to him, your dad always thought I'd put it in the wrong place. But anyway, me man win in, so I was so no great matter if I did. I've never been voting since, because I always happens. I've been canning tomatoes or some special job like that whenever there's an election. Uncle Tom says everyone ought to exercise her franchise, that it's a solemn duty. Listen to that. Don't be sounding foin. But would I be litten me to Matty's or me bake damson spoil because I had to traps off to Silverbridge to be votin? <laughs> sure, Patsy dear. Governments may go in and governments may go out, but the jam pots at Silverbush do have to be filled. <laughs>